Hello everyone, it is Jen with Pride and Grit and I am here today to talk a little bit about transition and finances. And since that is not my area of expertise, I am going to lean on um, one of our partners and sponsors for the Evolve Retreat, which is USAA. So we have Josh Andrews, who's going to join us today to give us and you his five best tips for managing and um, dealing with your transition as it relates to your finances. So super important part of the conversation. So Josh, thank you for joining us and spending a little bit of time with us and giving us all of your expertise. Well, thank you very much for having me. It's my second time joining Prime and Grid here. I'm excited. Um, I would love for those who haven't had a chance to meet you before and don't kind of know what you do at USAA, if you could just spend a minute giving us kind of the, um, the highlight reel for Josh and, and your path, and then we'll jump right into what we want to talk about. Yeah, definitely. So highlight reel in 30 seconds or less. <laughs> um, so I entered active duty in 2000 after I graduated from the Air Force Academy. I left active duty in 2012 and joined the Air Force Reserves at the same time when I joined USAA. And so right now my job is an advice director for military life. So think about this. Anytime military life or military life and finances meet at USAA, I'm in charge of that. So it keeps me very busy, obviously, with a military focused organization like like USAA. And then I retired out of the reserves uh, about almost two years ago now. So back in June 2020, I'm enjoying the military retired life, looking to when I turn 60 so I can get some of those military benefits we're going to talk about today. So that's Absolutely. me in 30 seconds. Absolutely. I like it. Thank you. Um, so I'm curious, you know, you talked a little bit about kind of the transition, like when you went through this process, what was there any, um, you know, anything looking back on that now, was there anything really surprising for you that you kind of came up against when you were doing your own transition and your own finances? So I would say, and we're going to get this into, I think, the fifth point, but medical expenses was my biggest lesson learned. Okay. Obviously, coming out of high school, going to the Air Force Academy, and then I was always under TRICARE. And so that's all I'd known. I did not realize just how expensive it was, how you needed to shop around. A prescription at Walmart is, is not the same as a prescription at Kroger, right? Um, I, I, didn't, I didn't understand that, and I didn't realize how important it is to, if you go to the ER, you go to this hospital or that hospital, it, it, can, it can be different. You get the same level of service, but one can be more expensive than the other. So doing that research ahead of time and how it's going to impact your budget was my personal biggest lesson learned when I went from military to civilian life. Yeah, I bet you're not alone in that, I imagine. Yeah. Um, all right, well, so to your point, let's talk about these points that you've shared with us um, for kind of your top transition points. So we're going to go through each of these individually, but if you want to just sort of talk through these five generally, and then we'll kind of spend a little bit of time really diving into it. And if anyone is joining us and has questions, feel free to drop those in. If you're catching this on the replay, feel free to one, let us know that that's where you saw us. And then also go ahead and ask Josh or I any questions and we'll make sure we get those answers for you. So Josh, take it away. Why are these your top five tips for finances for transition? So these are the five, top five tips because as we develop the military life experience at USA, especially the leaving the military, and as we talk with people who are leaving the military, and as military affairs is full of veterans who have left the military, these are the five we all faced. These are five common, and, and if you ask any veteran who's left the military, what are your top five? My guess is they're going to come up with these. Maybe not the budget, because a lot of people don't like budget, right? That <laughs> one's thrown in there because I'm a, I'm a financial advisor by nature. So that one, right, if you're going to get me on an interview, I'm going to talk about a budget. That's just That just comes with the territory. But never too early, right? Having a transition fund, creating a civilian budget, location, location, location and then benefits. And so those are the five because they are common to every single person who transitions from military to civilian life. Well, and I think that's a really important point because, you know, our community for, for Pride and Gray, right, we focus very heavily on seasoned spouses. And, and so with that comes often more retiring service members. But, you know, certainly this, this video could be seen and, and this information could be shared with anyone who's in the transition space and is working through that. And so I love what you're saying in terms of these apply to everyone. They may look a little different for each person who's going through it, but um, these are all sort of things you want to check off. So talk to us a little bit about the early part. From your perspective, 
when, you know, if, if, if you could get to service members, the moment, you know, that, that you think is the right moment, what is that moment for starting to think about finances for transition? Um, right after basic training. <laughs> so, so we're going to go back early. And the reason I say that is because especially for, you know, most enlisted, they, they, they serve one turn to get out, you know, so really having that conversation as soon as you get out of basic training is what are you doing to plan that, that transition? Because if you don't have a plan, then you may find that you're can't leave, leave, leave the military because you're not prepared. And the last thing you want to do is say, I really don't want to stay in another term, but I have to, because I'm not prepared. Right. right? So plan that transition ahead of time. Um, and then just update it as you go on, you take another one. You know, I remember I was having a con conversation with one of our um, retired Marines in military affairs. And he said he had a transition plan for the last 15 years. He served in the Marines. He served 30 years because he didn't know if he was going to be taking another assignment, but he kept taking another assignment, another assignment, but he always had that transition plan in place. Um, and then you just update that transition plan with the things we're going to talk about today. If you continue to take it and you become a seasoned military spouse and then you do retire, your plan changes a little bit but you always have it in your back pocket because for most of us, we kind of control when we leave the military, but at times when there's a reduction in force, you don't get to control that. And so have a plan for if, if that, if that happens. No, absolutely. So going, you know, thinking about what, what are the elements of that planning process? I'm assuming your next bullet kind of fits into that in terms of making sure you're, you're preparing from a savings standpoint. So when you look at that next bullet of, of a transition mm -hmm. fund, what does that really, you know, ideally, what does that look like from your perspective for someone? So the goal of the transition fund is to help reduce financial stress when you leave the military. So a 2019 Pew Research study said that among post 9-11 veterans, 47%, sorry, 43% of them took six months or longer to find a job. And so if your kids are like mine, whether I have a job or not, they want to eat, right? Our kids want to eat. And so that transition fund is there to help that transition, right? So you got your emergency fund, three to six months. This is on top of your emergency fund because leaving the military should not be seen as an emergency. It's something we plan for. <laughs> and so we look at six to 12 months of living expenses, which is a big number. Right. You think of six to 12 months on top of your emergency fund. That's a big number, which is also why I said start early so that you, yeah. can, start, so you can start saving for this. But, you know, things I learned is I had four nice pairs of clothes, one for each Sunday of the month, because I was a pilot and I wore flight suit the whole time. Right. Um, well, USAA won't let me wear a flight suit <laughs> as much as I wanted to. As much as I asked, I had to have some professional clothes and shoes, a tie, a coat that costs money. Job search expenses can cost money. Um, providing income for your family while you don't have a job, it takes money. Um, you know, how many times, and I'm sure you have, you've, you've talked with a, you know, a spouse or even the military member, and they took the first job that came along simply because they needed income. Where if they maybe had a nest egg there sitting there to, you know, support them for a couple months, then they could have waited for that job that they really wanted versus having to take the first one that, that that came along. And I'm sure you've experienced that as well as you talk to people. Yeah, no, I've definitely heard, you know, different sort of different ways of approaching it. And and some are very comfortable with kind of just taking that first thing and 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 waiting for the for the thing they really want. But I it's always interesting to talk to folks who've put that time in to really plan for the gap and plan for and even I think even for retirees this is the case because you know even though there is a retirement there it's not anywhere near, you know, what you were making before. And so unless you are going to make up that gap, you're going to, somebody is going to have to go cover the gap. Yeah. And so planning ahead, I think often allows the service member to have the space to just hang out in that gap for a bit and figure yeah. out what they really want to do because you've done military for 20 years. So figuring out kind of what the next version of you looks like, yeah. that doesn't always come overnight. Sometimes that takes time and if you haven't, you know, I think a lot of times people have, you know, you can have, depending on your job, right, you can have a really busy career all the way up until the end. It's not like that last year, you're always going to be just sitting around with nothing to do, but figure out what you want to do next. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes you have to make that gap. And sometimes that might have to be after 
you know, you've got your paperwork in hand. So um, I've definitely, definitely seen it both ways, but I, personally for us, like mm -hmm. I, I, we've talked about that. I would really love, you know, whenever that happens for there to be the, the flexibility for my husband to just take the time he wants and figure out, you know, and, and pick the thing that he's really going to love, you know, on the other side, whenever that is. So. Yeah. And, you know, and that's, a, and everything you mentioned is another reason I say start early because, you know, you may not know what you want to do and you may have to research or, is your, you know, for the military member, is their resume up to date? Do they have a civilian resume? Is it demilitarized, right? A lot of times, you know, the, the spouse has a, has a good resume because they've had civilian jobs or, you know, they've had that, but the military member, it's full of military jargon that they need their spouse's help with to, to, de, to demilitarize. That, that is, um, isn't going to work. <laughs> yeah, it's not going to work. And maybe they need to get a particular designation or they need to, actually go back to school and that's where military retirement and also a spouse if the spouse has a job that they can carry with them from pcs to pcs and on mm -hmm. that final pcs as you said that helps bridge the gap so that you don't have to take that that first job and you can take that time to find out exactly what you want to do and work towards building your career in the industry you want to you know hopefully stay in the rest until you retire Right. Yep, for sure. So I wanted to just throw up JJ's comment. Um, thanks, JJ, for hanging out with us. But also a friend of Pride and Grit. And I was grateful to have you around, but love the the part about beginning early. Because I think I didn't even think about the fact that if someone, you know, is is starting their career and they're they're from the very beginning, not intending it to be, you know, a, a 20 year career, then you're actually should start thinking about transition from day one. Like I, that wouldn't, I wouldn't have thought of it that early. So I think it's a really mm -hmm. good point. One, you don't know exactly when. Um, and, and so, you know, why not at least understand some of those elements? So you're not surprised by it. Um, and, and to that point, 85% of the military don't retire. That's 85%. Yeah, that's a lot. It's not that high. So only 15% retire. So that's why I was like, when do I start as soon as as soon as you get in the military, because chances are you're not going to go full 20 years or later and, and retire. So start as soon as possible. Yeah. Well, and the other thing I love that you said was the idea that that transition fund is in addition to an emergency fund, because even in my head, I thought, OK, I'll just sort of lump. OK, we need six months, um, you know, of, of that gap. But really, it's like nine months of that gap. Um, and so I, I hadn't thought of it that way either. So I appreciate that. Um, so you talked about how much, you know, you you are a, um, a fan of budget. So talk to us yeah. a little bit about that civilian budget and how we may get a little bit surprised by how that civilian budget looks. So civilian, anytime you have a life event, and I would think we'd all agree that leaving the military to go to civilian life is a huge life event. There's probably going to be changes in income and changes in expenses, which means you need to re revisit your, your budget. The goal is to spend less than you earn, right? That's a USA core advice belief. If you're spending more than you're earning, you're, you're going into debt That's at some way, right? Um, because in the military, if you lose BAH or BAS, those are tax free. So which means your taxes are going to go up. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, there's a reason mili most military members live in what? Texas, Nevada, Florida. <laughs> Tennessee, Washington, and Alaska. Mm -hmm. No state income tax. Right. But if you take a job and you settle in California, well, now you're going to be paying California state taxes. So taxes go up, expenses go up, income could go up or down. Um, and so that's why it warrants revisiting your budget. You know, I've got an example here. Um, so and I'm using this and understand I'm saying this, that I am very happy with the health insurance USA provides for us <laughs> and how it's subsidized. But I talked about my biggest lesson learned in medical expenses. Right now, I pay $2,500 a year just for the privilege of having health insurance. That's if I, you know, I go to my doctor once a year after the free checkup. Then we have $1,500 family um, individual deductible and $4,500 family deductible. Mm -hmm. So theoretically, I could be out of pocket $7,000 before my insurance company has to pay a dime. Right. What's that like with TRICARE? Right. Huge difference. Huge difference, right? And that needs to be counted for in your budget. And that was, and that's why I keep coming back to that was my biggest lesson learned. I mean, I just didn't realize it could be $7,000. You know, my son, my son, I had to carry him to the ER when we we're stationed at Eglin Air Force Base. No charge. Mm-hmm six months on military on civilian insurance here at USAA 
had to carry my daughter to the emergency room, I got a $2,500 bill. Yeah. I mean, that's when it hit me like, oh, this is expensive. And so taxes increase, income expenses change, medical expenses need to be accounted for. So you need you need to revisit your your, your budget, right? Unless you're getting a fairly sizable bump in pay on the civilian side, you're probably going to have less take home pay. And, and it just needs to be adjusted for. Well, and I, I wonder, you know, to your point, like how often service, I know it's, I'm sure it's part of the transition course and all of that, you know, doing a budget, but by then you've already made the decision, you know, when you're sitting in the transition course is not the time to understand how much you're going to need to make to replace mm-hmm. the military income that you have, like that should be well in advance so that there are no surprises. That's just, oh, let me let me show you the one I've already done because I've already yeah. figured out what we need or what I'm going to need and and what that's going to look like. And I think it also is is empowering from the sense of, you know, when you're looking at jobs and you're talking to employers and you're looking for what is the compensation package that yeah. I need, you're able to really understand fully what is a, an, an apples to apples replacement of what you currently have, what is actually better. And, and in better in what way mm-hmm. so that you can, you know, look at these different jobs and, and understand, oh, well, this one has better medical. I know that that can really cost me a yes. lot. So maybe that is actually a better job because the medical's better, even though the salary may be lower or whatever. Like, I think just mm-hmm. I think that budget conversation opens up the door to so many other important conversations about what are you going to do after and how what kind of money do you need to make, you know, to, to keep the lifestyle that, that you would like um, after the military? Yeah. And comparing, you know, we could go into a whole conversation <laughs> on how to compare mati- um, military income with civilian income. She got paid time off differences and we're going to, we're going to actually hit like 401k and mm-hmm. matching or, you know, maybe your company stock options. How do you, how do you compare stock options? medical is a huge one. I remember my, my brother called me up one time because he was upset and wondered if he needed to change jobs because his employer actually paid all their healthcare expenses. Zero out of pocket. It was like TRICARE and they were increasing and saying, now you got to pay $250 a year maximum out of pocket. And he was upset, right? Wow. But then I had to put it in perspective and say, you know, you know, John, my brother, I'm like, I pay $2,500 a year just to have insurance. Right. Like, oh, Okay, I don't have it that bad. <laughs> I'm like, no. But, <laughs> but when you're comparing jobs, you have to take all that all that into account, and it's just it's just lessons you have to learn. Yeah. Well, and and correct me if I'm wrong, but as a retiree, you do have access to a version of the medical that does allow for it. You know, there is some coverage for that. So if you're retiring, it's a slightly different calculation and a slightly different thing to consider than. Um, it is not retiring, correct? It, it, it is exactly. So I, I looked it up before we came on. So right now, TRICARE retiree, depending on which group you're in, is either $647 or $784 for a family, right? Individual coverage is cheaper, and that's per year. Oh, that's and per year. Okay. Per year. And that's, that's yeah. low out-of-pocket cost. I mean, for sure. You know, that's why when I said I'm looking forward to when I turn 60 so I can get back on TRICARE because it's going to save me a lot of money. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, um, you know, you, you can say, well, I may have to change doctors. I may have to do that, but it's going to save me a lot of money, um, you know, to when I get off civilian insurance, which once again, I'm very happy. You know, if USA is watching, I'm very happy with, with what we have, <laughs> you know, but, but it is, but it is cheaper. It is yeah. cheaper. And so as a military retiree, you take the, your military retirement into account, lower medical costs and all that kind of helps limit how much you may need to be spending out of your pocket each month while you're waiting for that job to show up. Yep. No, absolutely. And, you know, I think it, it is, it is one of those surprise places, right? It, it, it is, you, it is an area where expenses can add up incredibly quickly. And it goes back to that first bullet, right? Having it, having that emergency fund, making sure that that is there because those expenses could, you know, could add up in a way that you haven't really seen them do in the past when, you know, you have to go to the ER or what have you. Yeah. Um, all right. So let's talk about another piece that plays into decisions around transition. And that um, for you was location. So talk yeah. to us a little bit about what what are the things you think folks really need to be cognizant of when they're deciding about their you know post military location? So it all comes down to cost of living, and so I, I actually ran a scenario and I ran some, some examples to help illustrate this. 
So I took and I use USA's military separation assessment. And so we're looking at an E7, retiring at 20 years in San Antonio, earning BAH with, with dependents, right? So your standard E7 retiring in San Antonio. If they decide to stay in San Antonio, they have to earn $4,300 more per year to have the same standard of living, right? That's taxes and some in, increased medical costs and thing, thing, things like that. If they move to Tupelo, Mississippi, right, $5,500 less per year is what they have to make because of mm -hmm. the lower co cost of living. Mm -hmm. Now, what if they move to Honolulu, Hawaii? What do you think that is? Hi. What's your best guess? <laughs> like double? <laughs> they have to make $115,000 more. More than what they're making now in the military to have the same standard of living, right? Wow. Location matters. Yeah. So if you're offered an $80,000 job in Tupelo or a $100,000 job in Honolulu, which one is looking more attractive just from a financial standpoint, yeah. right? I, I'm not talking scenery. Sure. Right? Not talking scenery. Yeah, no, very different places. No, but I mean, I think that to your point, it's, it is such an important part of the equation to, you know, yes, I think, if you want to go where you want to go, like yeah. you, you should do that, right? Like yeah. this is your chance to kind of, you know, chart a new path and and you should do that, but know what you're getting into and know what that cost is going to be in terms of either the employment that you need or just the collective for the whole family. If, you know, both you and your spouse are working, then, you know, together what you need to, mm -hmm. to be able to live in that place. Because um, for some people, like, that Honolulu might be where their family is. And so that's where they've always wanted to go back to. Mm -hmm. You can do that, but planning ahead, I think matters. And sometimes I think it it, it is easy to not really notice those mm -hmm. massive changes in cost of living until you actually sit down. I know there's some really good online calculators where you can you know, plug in a city and compare it to another city and actually yeah. see one for one in all the different areas, what is actually more expensive. Because sometimes like in the DC area, I remember doing this for, for us when I looked at it relative to Washington state, you know, you always think of DC as really expensive and it is, but when I looked at it, it's really just the housing, like the other stuff was mm -hmm. actually about the same or in some cases less than what we had when we were in Washington, but the housing is where it gets you. So yeah. sometimes if you just know what el what element is causing that higher cost of living then you can figure out, well, is that an element that matters to me? Is it childcare? And I don't have kids. And so that's not a factor. Like, I think you have to understand the whole picture, not just those numbers. And I think sometimes we like, we just want the bottom line. We just look at the, at the number and we sometimes have to kind of peel back the layers to understand Great. what's behind it. I, I completely agree. It takes, it takes the whole picture, but you know, unfortunately, and this is one, one another lesson I learned right in the military, when we move, they maintain our standard of living by adjusting BAH or giving us a COLA. Well, it isn't like that. So in the military, we're kind of almost conditioned to, if I have more money, it's the same standard of living because we just move. It's, it's you know, they, they adjust it and we maintain the same standard of living. It's just not like that on, on the civilian side. And, you know, JJ always uses an example. If you want to live in Manhattan, New York versus Manhattan, Kansas, <laughs> you just what you want, uh -huh. but there's going to be a big difference. Yeah. You know, and, and, and you may have to make sacrifices in one place or the other. You may have, you know, more, more ability to save for retirement mm -hmm. if you live in Tupelo, but you got nothing to do because you're in Tupelo. Right. And right. I can say that because my wife's family is from Mississippi. Right. right? So, I, so I can say that um, where in Honolulu, you may it may impact your ability to save for retirement. But you but you get to go surfing on the beach, you know, on the waves for four out of you know seven days out of a week. And so yeah. what's important to you? And just understanding it. Yeah, I always love the phrase that saying yes to something means saying no to something else. And I think this is no exception, right? Saying yes to, you know, the being on the beach and surfing every day mm -hmm. means you're saying potentially no to a more robust retirement. But just yeah. know that those are the choices that you're making. Yeah, <laughs> JJ, JJ continues to advocate for Kansas. <laughs> Always Kansas. <laughs> I love it. He, he, li he likes those chiefs too much. <laughs> All right. So let's talk about, and we've, we've kind of just tipped around it a little bit, but um, the, uh, the last tip that you have here of these five, which is to really assess your benefits. We've talked a little bit about the medical. So I think we've 
I think yep. we've probably exhausted that one. Mm -hmm. But when you think of this benefits bucket, what are all the elements that are in there for you that we should consider? So the first thing is understand that when you leave the military, SGLI is going away, right? So your service members group life insurance is going away and the FSGLI is going away for the spouses and the children. My guess is just because you're leaving the military doesn't mean that the need for that life insurance is going, going away. Mm -hmm. You got you to replace it. Okay. Now, for the military member, they can have VGLI or Veterans Group Life Insurance as an option, but it's fairly expensive when you look at it over, over time because it increased costs every five years. And then when you get to really need it when you're 50, 55, and 60, it's just way expensive. Oh, it's so expensive. So expensive. But it's a good thing it's there because it's really for those individuals who can't qualify for a private life insurance policy on their own due to conditions that they've had in the military, right? So more than likely, most people when SGLI is going to go away, um, they need to replace it with a private life insurance policy. And the sooner you do that, better because mm -hmm. it's based on your health and your age. So the sooner you establish that, usually the cheaper it is. And the healthier you are, usually the cheaper it is. Right. So, so having a plan. Um, and I know we briefly talked about the medical, but sometimes your employer may not provide medical depending on where you work. You know, maybe you're maybe you're getting on the gig economy. You, mm -hmm. You're not going to work for one employer. You're going to work on, on a gig economy and you're going to, you know, be a contractor that kind of, you know, does your, your job in between different companies. Well, then you're probably looking at making sure you have medical either through the exchange or through a private employer, you know, just going and buying your own medical part of it. Um, that's if you don't have TRICARE, if you have TRICARE, it makes things so much simpler, right? Sure. It's such a great benefit. Yeah. Um, but, the, but a big piece of the puzzle, just, you know, understanding how you're going to, how you're going to replace that, assuming mm -hmm. that, you know, that you want to be doing that and probably you do. Um, yeah. and, and I think to your point, making sure you do that early, um, because mm -hmm. I think often, you know, when certainly in my twenties, I would have never imagined I needed anything. Right. And oh, that yeah. would have been the cheapest time to buy anything. <laughs> It would have been. We're all in both of those. ship is long since sailed, <laughs> and um, that is not an option. But, but you don't, you know, you just don't think about it because either you don't have kids or you don't really have a lot of assets accumulated, and so you just you're not really thinking through, you know, needing to pay off a house or you know whatever it might be. But um, there's lots of other things that I think make that important when you when you look at the long term and you look at how could this matter to me in 10 or 15 years yeah. um, and, and how could I make it, you know, cheaper by, um, by getting in a little bit earlier on, on that. So what else besides the life insurance? We've got life insurance, we've got the, um, the medical we've talked medical. about, what other benefits? Um, and the last thing is one that actually impacted me is disability insurance. Mm. Uh, so when you're in the military and you get injured, you get a sick call form and the paycheck can, can continue to roll in until you get better. Right. It isn't like that on the on the, on the civilian side, right? Now you have short-term disability and long-term disability, you know, through through the state and the employer, but those are not at your full salary, right? So think, can I just reduce my salary by fifty percent today and live? Yeah, a lot, right? So that's where emergency fund comes in, but also disability insurance, right? And so one thing, you know, I, and I, and I said it mentioned me disability insurance, but for me it was long-term care insurance. Mm. I tried to establish my long-term care insurance, but, you know, due to my medical disability from the military, from flying for too long, um, I no longer qualify. Mm. They, they won't insure me. So now my wife could get long-term long, long -term care insurance, right? But, you know, when you look at the stat of one out of every two people at, at over the age of 60 will use a long-term care insurance policy or could use it while have any, some sort of disability in retirement. That long-term care policy is there and obviously disability insurance is for while you're working long-term care insurance is you know for later on but you can use it while you're working i no longer qualify interesting and so i waited too long i should have i should have gotten it much earlier um i waited too long i, I no longer qualify so now that's something we have to self-insure for me um so disability insurance is is very key and understanding civilian benefits i'll be honest with you it's confusing mm -hmm. right? every year uh, annual enrollment comes up, I learn something new. <laughs> I do. And so it's such a confusing and it's so different than the military that um, we actually have a podcast called the Military Moves Podcast. Mm -hmm. And we actually devoted two episodes, episode seven and episode eight. And you go out on YouTube and look it up. But we devoted two entire episodes. Now they're a little long, <laughs> but there's a lot to cover. 
Yeah, there's we a lot. Got our military, and we got our vice director, Sean Scaturo, who's over our life and health, who understands these things in and out. He's yeah. responsible for the USAA. And we, I just pummel him with, with questions that I had when I left the military. And hopefully those who are leaving the military can listen to him and be in a better situation than, than I was. Yeah, I think we had Sean on last year. I feel like that. I feel like I can. I can almost picture it. And I think he talked about life insurance, if I recall. So oh, he, um, he's good. He understands that. And every year something comes up, a question. He's who I reach out to. Right. Mm -hmm. I have his phone number, and I'm not. I'm not giving you his phone number, so you can. Everybody can reach out to him. But go find your own Sean, right? Because I have mine. Um, but we did try to take his knowledge and put it in those two podcasts to really help people. So I'd really recommend going out there and listen to it. Yeah. And I'll drop after we're done, I'll drop the links to those. Cause I, um, I think, you know, just knowing where the podcast is, I think could be helpful for folks when there's a question that comes up and a topic that they want to learn more about. Um, the podcast is great for kind of digging in on a specific topic. Yeah. Um, and then I guess the only thing we haven't really talked about is like, I feel like it's the elephant in the room, which is, um, which is SVP. So that comes up a lot, um, particularly in our audience with folks who are retiring and are making those, you know, determinations about SVP. So for folks who are in that space of trying to figure out if it's the right thing for them, first, if you could just explain if someone doesn't know what that is, and then what your best recommendation is for how people go through the process of figuring out if that's right for them. Definitely. So the survivor benefit plan basically says, if the military member dies, we pass a portion of that military income, the military retirement check to their business designated beneficiary who is all, often their spouse, right? Um, now it's available for active duty and guard, guard, guard and reserve. Guard and reserve have a little bit different options because we don't get ours until we turn 60 usually. So we have a great period from the time we retire. And so there's options A, B, and C. Um, and so you, you can look at those. I, I recommend option C and USA do, does as well. but. So the, but the survive, it's important to note that the survivor benefit plan, it costs money, right? You're getting a benefit to pass, so it does cost some money. And so the, the question always comes down to, should I pay that? Is it worth paying that? And, you know, Jen and I were talking before before we started, and when we've run the scenarios, and I've ran them, and JJ's ran them, and we ran them together, <laughs> for the majority of the people, it makes sense to take it. And so that's why USA's belief is take the survivor benefit plan. Are there fringe scenarios where it doesn't make sense? Yes. I remember I was talking with this one E6 who was about to retire. And he said, I'm not, I'm not taking the survivor benefit plan. I said, okay, well, does your spouse not need income? And they said, no, she has a $250 million trust fund she can pull from. I'm like, okay, you probably don't need this, you know, the extra, you know, $800 or $900 per month that the survivor benefit plan would give you. Um, and there's some situations where the spouse may be, Military spouse may be much older than the than the uh, non-military spouse who is much younger. So talk with a qualified financial planner who can run the situations for you because usually you're seeking to replace that with permanent life insurance um, and the cost of that. And depending on your health, you see it can get tricky. Mm -hmm. But just overall, for the majority of people, survivor benefit plan makes a decision. And I put my money where my mouth is because I chose option C for mine so that when I die, 50% of my military uh, retirement goes to my spouse. So I, I, firmly, I believe in it enough that I actually chose to do that with my own military retirement when I re retired from the reserves. Well, and I, you know, I, I appreciate you sharing that with us. And I also appreciate that, like one of the things you said, which is that, you know, for, for SVP, but I really think it applies for all of this don't make these decisions in a vacuum, right? There's a lot of complexity to it, or there can be. Mm -hmm. And so don't assume that you have all the pieces unless you've talked to some folks who've done it over and over and over again and do it for a living um, mm -hmm. and find some professionals that you can lean on to just make sure you have checked all the boxes and have all the information to make the best decisions for your transition. Um, because there's a lot that goes into transition anyway, and and not being surprised by finances, it, it'd be great if that wasn't part of your, of your story. Um, because I think there's there's just I was listening to a, uh, another uh, show earlier, and it was a checklist about transition and, and all the things um, that you can that, that you that you need to do. And and there's just there is just so much, right? There's so much dimension to it. There's so a lot. Lean, lean on folks who know how to how to aid you in that and how to ask the right questions mm -hmm. to help you get to the right answers. 
Yeah, and and there there's so much stuff. That's why USA we actually have the the separation checklist, right? If you go mm. to USA.com forward slash leave in the military, um, on there we have a separation checklist, and all it does is organize this stuff, right? Now it, it gives some advice and tips, but sometimes it's just, hey, you need to think about this because every single's answer to that, every single person's answer to that question could be different mm-hmm. um, based on their unique situation, but it's something you need to consider. And trust me. As you're leaving the military and maybe you're starting a new job, you know, I had eight days from the time I left Las Vegas till I started at USAA. And so um, that is not the time that I need to be able to sit down and think of a two page list of everything I need to consider. <laughs> I need someone to do that for me. And, and that's what USAA has, has done. And some of it may not apply to you based on your, your situation, but some of it will. And it'll be just a good reminder and good to step you through the process. So that you can hopefully transition with less financial stress and yeah. less stress overall. Absolutely, that's like that's the goal, right? Yeah. Um, we will. I'll make sure I add that to the to the chat as well, um, to the comments, so that folks can grab that checklist. So I appreciate you mentioning that. Um, any closing thoughts or anything we haven't touched on that you feel like is important for folks to consider for finances? Um, I wouldn't say not for finances, but one for I would say family well-being, right? Mm-hmm. I feel that a lot of times when we talk about leaving the military, the focus is on the military member, right? But we need to understand the spouses and kids transition to mm-hmm. spouses could be leaving their, their community behind at the, the installation where they're at. Kids, if they're on base, maybe, maybe they're leaving their friends, you know, that they're used to PCSing with. Um, so it's a transition for everybody. And so sometimes we get caught up in the finances and the medical stuff and the TRICARE, but let's not forget about the emotional side of the, of the transition as well. And while it is often a big change for the military member when they're not wearing the uniform anymore, it is also a big change for the children, you know, and the spouse. Um, so let's not forget to have those conversations and take care of all those aspects. Um, because the whole, it's not just the military member who serves, the whole family serves. So let's focus on them all. Well, and I, Josh and I did not rehearse this, but that could not have been Josh, a more perfect closing for us. Um, because I did want to take a minute to just, again, thank USAA for being one of our sponsors for the Evolve Retreat as the presenting sponsor this year. And so we are going to be doing it again. And we had, you know, such a great time last year working with exactly the audience you mentioned, right? spouses who are in this in this process of going through transition potentially with their service member or even seasoned spouses who may go through that down the road and just want to start to figure out that emotional side and figure out that personal development side for themselves the evolve retreat is a great place to come and do that so thank you to you for spending time with us thank you to usaa for continuing to believe that this community needs this kind of support um Because I think you're right. We're just starting to talk more about the -hmm. fact that transition is a family effort and it's a it's a team effort. And we need to see it as bigger than just the service member, because that helps the service member actually do that well. If the whole family is supported well through that process. Couldn't agree more. Could not agree more. Awesome. Well, I think we'll end it there. But thank you, Josh, for hanging out with us. And I don't know, maybe we'll see you again next year. (laughs) Oh, I hope so. I, I love doing these. Thank you very much for all you do. Thank you, Josh. Thank you all. And we will see you guys on the next video.